Today we're going to start genetics. So genetics is really the study of traits and inheritance. And inheritance really talks about how your traits get passed on to the next generation or to your offspring. So the main compound that we're going to be talking about when we discuss genetics is DNA, which most of you have heard of before. DNA stands for an incredibly long word, two words really, deoxyribonucleic acid. The ribo part we're going to learn later on refers to the sugar that's involved. There are the other types of nucleic acids which we'll be discussing in other times. So DNA really is our primary hereditary material. It's the main thing that we use in order to pass on our traits to the next generation. It allows the traits to pass on to our offspring. So back in the day, it used to be that most of the scientists didn't necessarily know how is it that my offspring kind of look like me. They didn't really understand how these traits were passed on from generation to generation. It wasn't until Gregor Mendel really started studying pea plants did we understand how these traits were passed on. DNA controls for the production of proteins. Proteins, as we've learned in the past, make up all sorts of things in our body, from hormones to antibodies and enzymes which control most of our reactions in the body. DNA is found in the nucleus. If the DNA does happen to leave the nucleus and the nucleus is destroyed, then our hereditary information can become destroyed and then that cell will more than likely go through some sort of program death. So DNA remains in the nucleus. We're going to see how that becomes important later on. DNA structure. So the structure of DNA has a main building block, just like a lot of our other molecules did when we talked about carbohydrates and proteins. So the DNA structure has a building block called a nucleotide, and the nucleotide has three main parts that we're going to discuss. It has a phosphate group, which has the element phosphorus in it. It has a sugar, which in this case, it's a five carbon sugar called deoxyribose, which is where the name comes from. And then it has a different type of nitrogenous base, depending on what order we're in and what part of the DNA we're looking at. There happen to be four different types of nitrogenous bases that DNA uses. The A represents the base called adenine. The T represents the base called thymine. G stands for guanine. And C stands for cytosine. So many times when we talk about DNA, we'll only use the first letter of each of the bases when we write it out and represent it. Oftentimes when we talk about DNA, we'll even only just use the base and will imply that the sugar and the phosphate are attached to it. Nucleotides form very long chains of repeating units, which in the past when we did talk about our other organic compounds, we called those polymers. So when our building blocks link together to form these long chains, that's considered to be a polymer. And remember, DNA is an organic compound. It's part of the nucleic acids, which is one of our last organic compounds we'll discuss. DNA structure was discovered in the 1950s by two researchers called Watson and Crick. Uh, it's pretty historic when they discovered the DNA structure being what's called a double helix. That's the term that they used. They were able to figure this out using special types of x-rays. So the DNA double helix has two what we call complementary strands. Complementary means that we have kind of like an opposite pairing Okay, so on the opposite side, we have something called the complement. We'll talk about those rules in a minute. The strands are twisted into a ladder spiral-like structure. So we see this spiraling ladder. The inside rungs of the ladder are made up of the nitrogenous bases, and the outside portions of the ladder are made up of the phosphate and the sugar. So the nitrogenous bases in the center are joined by weak hydrogen bonds. Those hydrogen bonds in the center are very weak so that it can actually break apart in order to replicate and carry out other processes. The pairing rules for DNA for this center portion where we have two nitrogenous bases together are as follows. If there is an A on one side, the complementary strand would have a T pairing with it, almost like a piece of a puzzle. If there's a T, and then the opposite side would have an A. A G will always pair with a C, and a C will always have a G opposite it. Okay, so A with T, T with A, G with C, and a C with a G. Those you're going to want to commit to memory. So if we look at this 
strands that we have here. We have two strands, they're called complementary, remember? We have a T on one side, an A on the other, a G with a C, a G with a C, and a T with an A. They could be reversed. We could have an A on this side and a T on the other. Just so happens this is what this strand looks like. So let's try and pause and try and complete the DNA strand yourself. See if you can remember the base pairing rules. If not, definitely go back and look in your notes and see how you do completing it. All right, now that you've paused and tried, let's see how you did. So on this side, I had an A, so I'm going to pair a T with that. On the opposite side, we had a G, so I'm gonna place a C. An A on this side would pair with a T, a G with a C, T with an A, T with an A, a G with my C, a G with a C, and my C with a G. If you struggled with that, please come in to class. We'll do some more practice. We're also going to have another one to practice on in a second. When we talk about DNA, we talk about something called the universal genetic code. And it's really just the sequences of bases in our DNA. We call it universal because most living organisms do use this same genetic code and are made up of DNA. When we talk about the living organisms in the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom, they all have DNA in them, which we share among everything. So the sequence of bases in our DNA are pretty unique to each individual. Humans have approximately four billion base pairs long of bases that make up our individual genetic code. And as we go along and read the genetic code, or there are computers that can read your genetic code, it's read in groups of three bases, which some people call triplets, or often it's typically called a codon. So that's any three bases in a row. It's kind of like as you're reading, you chunk together letters into words. Well, our body uses words of DNA that we call codons, but it just so happens that every word only has three bases. So in this example, if one side or one strand of our DNA had AAC as a triplet or a codon, CTG, GAA, then I'd like you to pause and try and see if you can figure out what the complementary strand would be using your base pairing rules that we did on the previous board. So pause and try, see how you did. All right, let's see how we did. So if we had an A on one strand, that would complement with a T. So again, we have a T. My C on one strand would complement with a G, and a G again, T with an A, a G with a C, a G with a C again, A with a T, and A with a T. So this would be a very short strand. That strand could eventually, if it was long enough, make up a protein, which would be part of one of our genes. Our genes, we're gonna learn later on, code for proteins. And it just so happens that the number and order of the bases control the type of proteins that are made by a gene. So really all a gene is is just a sequence or a portion of your DNA and that sequence is going to control your traits and the way it does that is by controlling the proteins that get made. That's it for our beginning of DNA structure. So if you would like to try to see if you can maybe make up a couple of strands yourself and practice making complementary strands, we're going to be doing that a little bit more in class as well.